August 4th, 2010, the day Minecraft Multiplayer was released to the public. Just a few hours later, the first Minecraft server ever, Minecraft.online opened. And a couple months later, 2B2T, the oldest anarchy server in Minecraft, opened. Alright, this is 2B2T and we're gonna take the only dragon egg ever. Hello everyone and welcome! Awesome. I'm here with the the Artscraft. Alright, awesome. Okay, we're here. Just waiting for my little minions to join. Oh, oh, here we go. That's it. <laughs> Alright, so uh, we're here in 2B2T. An awesome and amazing Minecraft server. Okay, I'm gonna jump. Go. Oh, oh god. Yes! <laughs> yeah! People wanted to play together. I mean, just a couple hours after the official Minecraft server jar released, someone had already set up a public server. If you ask your friends or any Minecraft player if they ever play the game by themselves, I guarantee you they'll probably say no. I mean, heck, most of them haven't even beat the game by themselves. You can't have Minecraft without multiplayer. So you would think, right? With so many people relying on this software and so much money to be made. I mean, some of these Minecraft servers are making like way more than a million dollars a year. I know the biggest one made like almost a billion. These are professional, highly qualified individuals developing these Minecraft servers that you know and play on, right? You couldn't be more wrong. From independent Minecraft servers not even being supported by Mojang in 2010, to the firestorm of a battle between Bucket and Microsoft, to the greatest exploit of all of Minecraft history. I once thought of the Minecraft server community as a stable, trustworthy place. And now, now I think it couldn't be more of the opposite. Call whoever the fuck you want whenever your fucking router's smoking by the side of your couch. DMCA takedown notice filed by a former Bucket developer. They're using things that he's coded. Some of these servers have been making thousands and thousands of dollars. In some cases, millions. He never actually put in a limit until over a year later of constant spamming at maximum speed. He's just utter incompetence. It all started here, May of 2009. Notch had just released Minecraft, or back then as it was known, Cave Game. And I kid you not, one weekend, he released it to TIG Source Forum, a forum for independent game developers. He would continue to update the game, and eventually, released it under the name Minecraft, which is now known as Minecraft Classic Edition. You know, it was cool, you could run around, place blocks, but something was missing. It was boring being all by yourself. No one to fight, no one to explore the world with. So eventually, Minecraft Alpha version 1.1.201 released. And along with it, the first ever Minecraft server jar file. You could finally play Minecraft with your friends. And people started talking, all right? I mean, the search term for Minecraft itself would skyrocket starting August 2010 to an outrageous 2,000% by April. And in the midst of all this, Hey Zero would create HMOD. You see, the old Minecraft server wasn't what we all know and love today. I mean, it was filled with instabilities, bugs, dupes. Heck, it didn't even allow you to adjust the player limit or change the MOTD. But the main reason people started switching from the vanilla Minecraft server over to HMOD is because HMOD allowed you to create your own plugins. Vanilla was like a regular Minecraft world. You could change game modes, game rules, start and stop the server. I mean, that was pretty much it. But HMOD, HMOD was an entirely different animal. You could slash home, slash TPA, kits. I mean, many of the features we take for granted today started with HMOD. It didn't take long though for H0 to lose interest in HMOD, which made it hard for the development team to develop it, as official releases would have to wait for Hey Zero's approval. HMOD was discontinued around 2010. Nevertheless, it was continued by Meeglin under a new name, Canary Mod, and was still being regularly updated up until January of 2015. In fact, Minecraft Online, the oldest running Minecraft server, still allegedly ran Canary Mod as late as November of 2022, due to many of HMOD plugins not having more modern replacements at that time. But due to Canary Mod not really being known at the time, and was more of an obscure, small group with little developers and staff, there was high demand for a new API which supported all Minecraft versions. Hello viewers, Into a Tactics here. I've been programming a bucket plugin called Hulk Out. In this video I'm going to show you how to set up a Minecraft server, and also how to load the bucket module, and then the plugins for bucket. Welcome back, Seth Bling here. Etho and I were talking the other night about how boring combat can be. So we kind of got together and and I wrote a bucket plugin. Bucket, a new Minecraft server API was on the rise. Formed in early 2011 by Evil Scythe, Luke GB, Tag, and TNT, 
Bucket was destined to be one of the most well-known and most successful server APIs by a long shot. Bucket had active staff and an actual development team, filled with many of the original HMod developers. And on top of that, they had close relationships with Mojang. Mojang actually met with Bucket developers, and later hired three of them to work on the vanilla server. Originally, Bucket was an open source project, but in February of 2012, Mojang took full ownership of Bucket, making using Bucket legal. That's right, Minecraft server modding was originally never supported by Mojang because we were taking the game's code and altering it to fit your need, effectively pirating the game, which is how cracked servers exist in the first place. But thankfully, since Mojang bought Bucket, it meant that Bucket was now legal. So I guess things were looking up from here. I mean, an actual large-scale server software with connections to notable figures at Mojang like Jeb himself, an active modding community that gave rise to the largest Minecraft plugins still in use today. What could go wrong? I will hashtag live and these die. motherfuckers. <laughs> what are you gonna do, bitch? What are you gonna do? Hey everyone, what's up? Some people were asking me if the Minecraft.net website was down. Basically, what happened was a DDoS attack. Hello, YouTube, and welcome back to the first video of Dead Hacker. Um, I'm going to be deleting this Minecraft server. Nobody's moving, and there I am. I got disconnected. As you can see, the server is offline. I'm be crying. You're gonna be crying. Please, Timpton. Please, Timpton. Please get him off me. Please, I want to play. I want to play online. Uh, I just recorded his line. He just kicked me. He just kicked you. Is you he think I'm a late hacker? Oh, I'll bro. show you what I can do, motherfucker. <laughs> Connection lost. Players immediately began using this new server software for the most malicious acts. 2010 to 2014 would mark the dark age of Minecraft servers, with DDoSing, doxing, and toxicity being at its all-time high during this time. Due to Minecraft server lists and advertising methods such as TikTok and YouTube being too obscure at the time or not even existing at all, there were five main tactics players used to compete against rivaling Minecraft servers, and all of them were extremely toxic. The first method was doxing. Doxing is the act of publicly providing personal information about someone without their consent. Doxing was usually used against fresh meat, people who had just opened their Minecraft server for the first time, and was used in attempts to scare the newcomer away, repelling them from ever hosting a Minecraft server again. Yeah, this is like definitely some of the beginner stuff. Whenever there was a new guy and he just showed up and he, you know, rented a $150 OVH server. Yeah, everyone would just dox him to try to scare him off. And a lot of the times it actually did. Yeah, this is just the beginning. People all saw it as they have a gig going and the new guy definitely was not getting any cuts of the pie. Doxing would often be combined with swatting, calling an emergency special weapons and tactics team to interrogate an innocent target. This emergency special weapons and tactics team or SWAT team for short, would sometimes surround your entire house and interrogate you, unpleasantly, even though you did nothing wrong. Good old DDoS team was also very commonly used in this era. You'd hire a hacker to take down a rival server, but then almost like a double agent. The hacker would ask for double the amount he was originally paid, but to the server that got taken down. And if they paid, he would go back to his original client and take their server down, causing an endless vacuum chamber. When people would hire someone to DDoS another server, since this guy's untrustworthy as well, he would go into the other server's team speak and say, Hey, wanna know why all your shit got nulled? It's because of me. Now, this other person ended up paying me $500 to take your shit offline, but if you wanna pay me $1,000, I'll end up taking his shit off and I'll stop hitting your shit off too. If you do that, he knows that you're willing to pay now and he's gonna come back. He's like a cat that you just fed it milk. Coupled with the fact that most servers were vulnerable to domain nabs, whereby a rival server would track down, say, the DNS of the domain, and find its exact lease and when it expires, buy it, and redirect it to their server. Imagine if the IP address of the server that you poured thousands of dollars, your life and your time into, was nabbed and redirected to someone else's server. It was so competitive that it got to the point where server owners sometimes would pay hundreds of dollars to a small team of 10 or sometimes even 15 hackers to 
to raid and kill all the players on a different server, incentivizing the victims to quit the now hacker-plagued server. Certain server owners will hire teams of hackers just to go like in waves to other servers. Have you ever been killed by a hacker after you just spent five hours grinding for gear? Yeah, that's what they would do because if you keep dying, you're gonna stop playing. So they get paid by a dude, go on some other map right when it releases and just hack. They would fly hack and just kill people over and over again. And if you ban them, these people specifically had several different VPNs, several different proxies. And to anyone watching this that like came from Fortnite and is thinking right now, well, they only have so many Minecraft accounts. Oh my God. Right here, accounts, MC accounts. Boom, look at all these different accounts. I didn't even do this shit and I already have this many accounts. Everyone had a massive bin of these. Like this one's quite small in all honesty. It all boiled over in September of 2014 when Notch sold Minecraft to Microsoft for $2.5 billion. Microsoft has bought Mojang, the employees and the games that they've been developing. Mojang has confirmed it's being sold to Microsoft for $2.5 billion. The news was confirmed on the developer's official site. Mojang have officially announced today that yes, they are in fact being bought by Microsoft. So Microsoft are going to acquire the rights to Mojang and the rights to Minecraft as a whole. Not exactly a bad day in the office. But this means that now Mojang, the small, nice, grateful Swedish company, doesn't own Bucket, the software all these servers have been using for so long. Microsoft does. The aggressive, greedy, data hoarding company. Just a month after this decision was announced, the lead developer of Bucket at the time, Evil Scythe, decided that one of the most greedy corporations in the world, owning his open source project, where, you know, people were just volunteering, was wrong. And I don't blame him. He announced he would be ending Bucket as a whole on the Bucket forums, to which Jeb responded on Twitter, Warren over at Bucket seems to have forgotten that the project was bought by Mojang over two years ago, and isn't his to discontinue. This obviously made Eagle Scythe mad, as because of Microsoft, his years of volunteering work as the head developer of Bucket, all without getting paid a dime, had led him to not even be able to make decisions on his own project. He decided instead to take down Bucket forcefully. He filed a DMCA copyright takedown request to take his personal contributions to Bucket off the internet. DMCA takedown notice filed by a former Bucket developer. They're using things that he's coded. Pretty much they're making Wesley seem like a total jackass when in fact Mojang has not helped Bucket at all. Over a quarter of the internal code written into Bucket's core was written by this guy. You can't just do, you can't just steal somebody's code like that. The guy put a significant portion of his life into writing that code. The law is the minute you write code, that code is yours. All the downloads for Bucket are down, down for legal reasons. You click this link and you'll get a DMCA takedown notice by Wellesley Wolf. This please be speechless. I don't know what to say. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I can't believe they did this. I just, I'm speechless for this. This is ridiculous. Since his personal contributions were so large, this resulted in around 150,000 lines of code being removed from Bucket, more than three times that of Mojang's original server software, and had cemented Bucket in the grave for good. This, I think, was a perfect early warning of what was to come. What is What's up, Drum Alert Nation? I'm your host, Killer Keemstar. Let's get right into the news. Shit is going down. For months, Mojang has been saying that server owners need to comply with the EULA. The EULA is basically like the Minecraft terms of service. Mojang is upset that Minecraft servers have been set up as pay to win. Some of these servers have been making thousands and thousands of dollars in some cases, millions. In April of 2016, pay-to-win Minecraft servers were at their all-time high, and the Minecraft player base was tired of it. Originally, in 2014, they started doing this is because Mojang themselves was getting emails, letters, phone calls from angry parents saying, hey, my son bought something on your server, on your game. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. That ain't our server. For those of you who don't know, a pay-to-win Minecraft server is where players use real-world money to gain an advantage against other players. 
Mojang has now finally officially started enforcing this EULA. So instead what they decided to do is update their uh, user agreement and kind of have some updated uh, policies towards a service. Any sorts of game assets, armor, tools, food, money are all good examples of pay to win mechanics. You can see why some players are tired of this, especially when it gets to the point where you can't even compete without buying something from the shop. All of this turmoil eventually led to Microsoft updating Minecraft's EULA the end user license agreement. The thing that you sign on buying the game and creating a Minecraft server, they updated the EULA to prohibit any sort of pay to win mechanics and blacklist any server that does not comply with Microsoft's requests. Now there's one giant flaw with this. Non pay to win servers make barely anything at all. I mean, there's even some cases of servers being in a deficit each month and having to come up with that extra money from your day job, etc. This is because the combined cost of paying to host the actual server, paying for the development team and server staff, paying for advertisements, paying for DDoS protection, and all the other miscellaneous things that I won't get into in this video, allow for most Minecraft servers only to get by if they have pay to win mechanics in the first place. For them, it costs a lot of money for all these plugins. You have to go buy these plugins. They usually aren't free. Well, you usually have to pay them. Plus, you have to pay people to staff your server. Mojang should have never sat back and let people make all these servers so they can make all this money. And then finally, once they're millionaires and billionaires, say, okay, now it's time to stop. There's a lot of things that Mojang, I say, they're screwing up. Okay, they're screwing up big time. A lot of people don't like them for this. They're getting a lot of hate right now. And I hope they can realize the mistake. Lots of servers just can't make money without uh, having to break the rules. 31 servers have already been targeted. They're not going to stop. All versions are going to be patched and your server is going to be blacklisted. And then you're going to have to scramble with your server sitting there with zero players on it to make yourself compliant. The burdensome and cost of hosting a non pay to win Minecraft server would eventually lead to most pay to win servers not complying with Minecraft's EULA and getting their IP blacklisted and banned, forcing them to shut down. And in the off chance that you did comply with the EULA, you probably just end up going bankrupt and shutting down your server anyways. Bucket was doomed from the start. I mean, it was literally a ticking time bomb. And I understand why. At any point, could Microsoft kick Bucket out and outlaw server modding for good? On top of that, you couldn't really get more than 100 Bucket players on one server. And that's with the best hardware and hosting available. Which means once you reach 100 players, you can't expand. It's like 2B2T all over again. Furthermore, Bucket didn't really increase performance from the original Minecraft server GR. It only ensured support for any Bucket plugins you might want to use. What needs to happen is somebody needs to rewrite a Minecraft compatible server that can do what Minecraft can do, but does it with its own code. I know there's people out there intelligent enough to do this. MD underscore 5, a longtime Minecraft veteran developer, UNI student, long distance runner, and probably one of, if not the greatest Minecraft server developer of all time, would launch Spigot, a new and improved bucket that promised faster and more optimized servers with higher player counts. Much like Bucket, Spigot had its own API and was forked from the original Minecraft code. There is one important difference though. You see, Spigot would inject the Minecraft server code when you open it. Put it this way. Bucket was an all-in-one package. You downloaded it, it had the code, it ran as normal. But Spigot would inject the code upon execution of the jar file, making it so they couldn't be held accountable for using Minecraft's code illegally. On top of that, Spigot would implement the same method of reverse engineering on Bucket's server, allowing players to use Bucket again. Spigot brought features never before seen by the Minecraft server community, and it eventually would get 250 players on one Minecraft server, breaking the previous record of 100. They would add an optional paywall on their plugin index, so developers could be paid for their work. And they allowed all bucket plugins to be run natively on Spigot. But even in the midst of all this, there's still one problem. You can't get more than 250 players. Minecraft just can't handle that many. Even with a development team of 40 plus at that time, Mojang just couldn't find a way to support more players. You see, Minecraft is not very efficient with running a large number of players on one server. Minecraft as a whole had a huge flaw with how their servers are programmed. After around 250 players online on the same server, any server would lag, even with the most powerful computer hardware available. And it's not even that Minecraft is too overwhelming for these computers either. It's that Minecraft is programmed to only take advantage of one single core on a CPU. But luckily in June of 2013, MD underscore 5 came up with a solution to this problem. By creating a proxy server that connected multiple servers together, 
you could create a network using multiple machines together. This is why when you join big servers like Hypixel and Minehut, they have multiple lobbies and servers you can switch between, instead of just one big server. This system is called BungieCord, and MD underscore 5 was the first one to develop it. Large network servers like Hypixel and Minehut could not function today without BungieCord, as one server can handle thousands of players, or in Hypixel's case, tens of thousands of players. Spigot and BungieCord would go on to dominate the server scene, facilitating the rise of the competitive rivalry between Hypixel and Mindplex back in 2013, and trailblazing the way for iconic plugins like Essentials X and Luckperms, which are still regularly being used to this day. In fact, most plugins developed today still use Spigot API due to it being the industry standard for so many years now. So why is Spigot not used now? Over time, and as updates have been released, most notably 1.13, which caused incredible amounts of lag and instability due to so many new features being released by Mojang in one update. It has become less optimized and less focused on reducing lag. And so with that, Paper came into existence. Well, would you want a Paper server? Well, maybe you want plugins on your server, or maybe you just want your server to be more efficient than a vanilla Minecraft server. In this quick guide, I'll be showing you how you can set up a brand new server for Paper Minecraft. Paper was started by a group of developers who yet again just wanted to improve upon the last server jar. But unlike Bucket, some servers still use Spigot to this day, despite Paper being the meta. Because there's not really any point in using Paper for older versions like 1.8.8, older servers continue to use Spigot, and some actually use their own modified version, like Club Spigot from Mindman Club, and whatever the magicians over at Hypixel use. Nevertheless, Paper is continuing to grow as the most popular server software, and has over 400 contributors. Well, Spigot only has a mere 100. If you, yes you, wanted to fix a bug at Paper, you could do it right now. No one's stopping you. And this leads to Paper being updated far more regularly and faster than Spigot is. Paper also adds async chunk generation, which basically just makes chunk loading much, much faster. And I mean, who doesn't like that? As the years continued, Paper has added more control and optimization to its software, such as fixing common dupes, better at breaking in exploits, or re-engineering the redstone mechanics, nerf lag machines, and improve performance. So it's no wonder that Paper overtook Spigot as the number one server software used, with over 56% of all servers using it, and only 25% using Spigot. But there's still a problem. It's so dependent on single-threaded performance, this needs to be fixed. The player limit. Despite all the optimization Paper did, servers still couldn't get more than 250 players on at one time. Yes, you can still string multiple servers together, but for big events and servers like 2B2T with upwards of 500 players sometimes trying to connect to one world, people need a better solution. How can it be possible to have so many players online with such high performance? Thankfully, because of a very talented developer team, there is a project called Folia in development, which effectively just splits the heavy load from the main thread into different regions. Folia. A new Minecraft server system made by the same people who created Paper MC. Such that when you have different players, instead of all of them having everything around them, all of these heavy operations being ticked all at once, what Folia does, it'll simply tick their region around them. Folia, a new server software developed by Paper, which aimed to add multi threading to the server. Folia worked by regionalizing the server. Put it this way, in a Minecraft map, there are many 16x16 16 16 chunks, all ran on one single thread of a CPU. Folia would split the chunks into different groups, for however many threads you have. Effectively powering one Minecraft world with multiple threads, and even multiple CPUs. This meant that however much you lag one region of the server, say the positive positive quadrant, the other three quadrants will be just fine, multi-threading previously laughed at by the community and thought of as a joke was now very much a real thing and many large servers have actually began to use it. Now this, this is where it starts to get weird. You guys have probably been noticing a reoccurring theme here. Some new software pops up promising to bring less lag and greater features than the last and completely dominates and wipes the floor with the ladder. That's not true for the rest of this video. After paper released, dozens of paper forks popped up all over GitHub, claiming incredible performance, unparalleled terrain generation, and even more stability than paper. 
These were all, for the most part, false claims, as all they were really doing is taking paper, adding performance updates that improved performance as much as the iPhone 15 improved durability, and at best, increased your chances of server corruption. But there was a few actually decent forks that I want to talk about today, such as Perper, which allows you to, let's say, change hard-coded values, such as the size of your inner chest, the amount of blocks pushable by pistons, stuff like that. But aside from that, the so-called Kronos prophecy was not being fulfilled here, with most of them shutting down in a matter of months after they were released. So with a flourishing new team of developers working on paper and folia, basically in the renaissance of Minecraft server development, what could go wrong? It was July of 2018 on the oldest anarchy server in Minecraft, 2B2T.org. One of, if not the most infamous Minecraft hacker group in the world, Nerds Incorporated, had just uncovered the most powerful and destructive Minecraft exploit in the world, NOCOM. The exploit, which has been named the most severe exploit in 2B2T history, was able to track real-time movements of over 300,000 players, found 15,000 bases, and stole over 200 million Minecraft items. And it was all made possible by Paper MC. Now let's make it clear. 2B2T was no stranger to backdoor shenanigans and exploits. It had been around since a couple months after multiplayer released and since then has been named the most toxic, ruthless, and destructive Minecraft server in the world, plagued with nasty players, for which all they cared about was getting your IP address. Alright, the following logs are from December 25th, 2015 on 2B2T. It starts out with Pop Bob saying, I'm out of alcohol. To which Jared responds, Pop, you can drink my semen. You are on your own. If seeing the worst foul language that you can imagine constantly filling up your chat window bothers you in any way, or if the idea of using a hacked Minecraft client to be competitive bothers you, just turn around now. So these player bases were very toxic to one another, always trying to destroy one another's base, killing each other, and so on. But this time it was different. You see, instead of hacking into the server directly, and gaining backdoor access like they had done previously. They chose a different, more subtle approach. In July of 2018, 0x22 and Baba J discovered a way to crash the server. By clicking on blocks everywhere across Stubitt's map, even in unloaded chunks, the server was forced to load thousands of chunks in mere seconds, causing terrible lag and eventually a server crash. Housemaster, the owner of the server, reported the bug to PaperMC on July 12, 2018. And remember how I talked about you, yes you, or anyone for that matter, can fix a bug at Paper? Well, someone did indeed fix that bug. They made it so chunks would only respond to the server if they were loaded by a player. So now, theoretically, if Nerds Inc. tried to click blocks everywhere on the server, they wouldn't get a response everywhere on the server. They would only get a response from an active chunk with a player in it allowing them to track the exact locations of every player on the server. This was all carefully and deliberately planned out by Nerds Incorporated. And on July 13th, Nerds Incorporated would have their first working version of the exploit, and they would go on to develop it into a more powerful and lethal version of its former self, and use it to grief, steal, and even spy on the activity of 2B2T players. All this went on for a whole three years until it was finally patched in July of 2021. I wish I could say this story ends here, but I don't think that's the case. NoCom was kept a secret for three years, caused by a relatively obscure paper MC vulnerability that was only found a second time around two years after it was originally discovered. There are undoubtedly more vulnerabilities here, and if there's not, it's only a matter of time until one is found capitalized on, and used to wreak havoc and destruction on every Minecraft server in the world, all over again.